if warring was right, I would rather take the field against so-called Christians if, as you state, Turks know nothing of the Christian faith, then they are but Turks of the flesh. But you, you who would be Christians yet persecute Christ's followers with a sword, you are Turks of the spirit. You arch heretic, you have seduced pious people. It would be better if you had never been born. I'm at the Gross Minster in Zurich, where Ulrich Zwingli launched the Reformation in Switzerland. From here, another branch of the Reformation also shot forth. It's called the Radical Reformation, or the Anabaptists. Anabaptist means rebaptizer. Some of Zwingli's eager young students had studied the scriptures and come to the conclusion that infant baptism was not in the Bible and that only those who had decided for themselves to become a follower of Christ should be baptized. Look up high on this church at something that symbolizes at least part of the reason for the division that developed here. There you see a statue of the Emperor Charlemagne. He is said to have ordered the construction of this church back in the 8th century. This illustrates how the linkage between church and state had been taken for granted for centuries. It was exactly this state-church relationship that the Anabaptists came to so vigorously oppose. The first Anabaptist, Zwingli's own students, were caught up in the exhilaration of Zwingli's reforms. But they said Zwingli was dragging his feet and going too slow. Zwingli, on the other hand, felt these young men wanted to go too far and too fast. He insisted on government involvement related to major changes in the church. After all, according to Zwingli, it was the city council that had made the Reformation in Zurich possible in the first place. So when the question of infant baptism could not be resolved within the church, Zwingli brought it to a public consideration before the city council on January 17, 1525. The council upheld infant baptism and those who wouldn't accept this decision were told to change their minds or leave or stay and face arrest. On January 21st, 1525, just a few days after the public debate and the city council's warning, the young dissidents met in the home of Felix Mons in Zurich. Mons was the son of a priest at the Grossminster. They considered their alternatives, whether to stay in Zurich or to flee. But then something else happened something that launched a new chapter in the history of Christianity. Baptize me. Baptize it. Brother, I cannot. Oh, yes, you can, and you must. Why? We've been ordered to submit the unbaptized for baptism, am I right? Yes, yes. of course. Yes. Yes. By rejecting the baptism of infants, am I not rejecting my own? If we defy the council, we will be imprisoned. Not imprisoned. Freed. George is right. Better a prison of stone than a prison of false conviction. Baptize me, brother. Rebaptism is a crime. Oh, not rebaptism, but a first true baptism. Brother George, you, uh, are you sorry for your past sins? Oh, that's a lot to be sorry for. <laughs> that is, and I am. By accepting the sign of baptism, is it your choice to now proclaim your faith before God and in the presence of these witnesses? It is. God, help me be strong. Then I baptize you, George Blaurock, in the name of God, Christ Jesus, 
the Holy Spirit. Give me your hand, brother. Brother George, as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God, so walk from this day forth in newness of life. The unthinkable had happened. To question the legitimacy of infant baptism in that age was to defy the authority of the church and its clergy, whether Catholic or Protestant. It was considered nothing less than an act of treason. Now things began to move incredibly fast. This is the village of Zolikon, just outside of Zurich. On Wednesday, January 25th, just four days after the first rebaptism, more than 30 people had already joined the movement. They established the first Anabaptist congregation here in this village. Then, four days later, on Sunday, George Blaurock came here to the village church. George was the one that we saw who was the first to be rebaptized. George barged into the church, interrupts the service, and tries to preach the sermon. The local bailiff stopped him. The next day, 15 members of Zolikon's congregation were arrested and thrown in jail. In the meantime, another development was taking place that would soon prove important to the new Anabaptist believers. It concerns a monk named Michael Sattler. He was prior, second only to the abbot, at St. Peter's Monastery in the Black Forest. We'll take up the rest of our story through his experience. In his position as prior, Michael Sattler had the miserable task of enforcing the collection of taxes from the poor peasants. He went through a long, soul-searching struggle, and so did his friend, a Beguin nun named Margaretha. Well? Well, I've done a lot of thinking lately. You think too much. About the church. As always. It's been difficult for us, hasn't it? It's always been difficult for monks and women. Natural enemies. I don't want it to be that way. <laughs> well, that's a comforting thought. I have something to tell you, Margaret. I'd be surprised if you didn't. I'm leaving. Leaving what? The monastery. The church. The church. Oh, my God. I thought a long time about this. You boldly told me that those walls of St. Peter's were very safe. You said that I never even had to look outside if I didn't want to. I never wanted to, but lately, I can't look anywhere else. Leaving the walls is one thing, but leaving the church, that's quite another. I would never force your conscience, Margareta. It's not mine I'm thinking of, Michael. You'll be a mocked man. You, you cannot stay in Austrian territory. I know. I, no. I just had to. I had to see you before I left to say, to tell you, to say. Farewell. You have no mercy. Perhaps if you'd ask for mercy. I don't even know where I'll go. I just, I just know. to seek the peace that eluded me in the monastery. I still can't offer a title. I can't even offer security or comfort, but I can offer wood. Offer you my, my hand in marriage. You are asking me to come with you. We felt something for each other once before. 
You entered the bigger notion I the monastery. I had hoped. Do you? Can you still feel something for me? Deepest price that I have had to pay the church was not being able to express my feelings for you. If you go with me, you may pay a steeper price for your affection. Yes. You ready to, to risk all to go with me? I bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Michael and Margaretha were now married, but spiritually isolated from the only world they had known. They soon came into contact with the early Anabaptists, and they cautiously examined their radical teachings. Michael and Margaretha pondered, was this what they both had been so long searching for? Meanwhile, to support his family, Michael took up weaving. <laughs> One bad thread. Pardon? I sewed the board of the single dyed thread, and it took over the bolt. So you've learned a lesson? No. We just keep making the same mistake over and over. Michael, I don't think it's... It takes only one bad thread to ruin the entire fabric, don't you see? We weave man's authority into God's and the church is corrupted. But we do have to live in the world. In the world, perhaps. But not of it. Is that possible? That's the truth of baptism. Leaving the kingdom of the world. And joining the kingdom of God. Yes. When I was a prior, I split my vows between Christ and the Duke. Luther, he divides his loyalty with the German state. Swingley, his counsel. Wilhelm is right. A baptism of choice signals that we break with the world in matters of faith. But Wilhelm had his peasants. Yes. The sword. When we accept its power, we invite its corruption. How can we avoid that? By forming a church separate from the power of the sword. The apostles had no duke, no prince. And no guarantees. What can you say to a woman who wants safety for her children? What guarantee can you offer a man for his family? Faith. Only faith. As Christ was raised from the dead, so walk in the newness of life. Rebaptism spread from village to village as new recruits joined the ranks. One eager young convert even demanded that early Anabaptist leader Conrad Grable baptize him here in the Rhine River at Schaffhausen. And that happened to be in the middle of February. That kind of incident helps us to understand, perhaps, why they were called radicals. It also helps us to understand why the Anabaptists loved to repeat the words they heard first from Ulrich Zwingli, that the word of God is as unstoppable as the Rhine. This was a time when the Turks were pushing across Europe from the east and leaving a devastating path of destruction in their wake. The Anabaptists at the same time were coming to the conviction that violence was wrong and contrary to the gospel. So many of them refused to take up weapons to fight the Turks. This meant that Anabaptists were now seen as far more than religious heretics. They were traitors as well. Still, their numbers continued to grow but they were understandably disorganized and fragmented. How do you unify a people that is on the run, meeting in secret, and in constant danger of arrest? Now Felix, drown! 
A secret meeting of Anabaptists was convened at the Swiss border town of Schleitheim in January of 1527. Believers slipped in from Switzerland, Germany, and Austria. Michael Sattler emerged as the leader to bring the diverse groups together. Many of you know I am a weaver. <laughs> For many years, the good Lord protected the world from my obvious talents as a weaver by confining me to a monastery. <laughs> But somehow, somehow I escaped. And I managed to spin some cloth. And I brought this specimen here today. Tell me, what would you give me for this? A broken barrel. Or a dead goat. <laughs> You're a sensible people. You can see that the cloth is ruined. And you won't uh, waste your good earnings to buy it. One of the first things I learned when I began weaving was that it takes only one bad thread, only one poorly mixed dye to destroy an entire cloth. Like my brother Wilhelm, I'm afraid. I fear for those in prison. I weep for those who have died and will die as Anabaptists. But I fear even more the consequences of compromise. For if we allow the power of this world to be threaded into the fabric of Christ's church, all of us, all of us, we've seen the results. Compassion turns to pride, charity to greed, Truth becomes fabrication, salvation, citizenship, peace, oppression. And faith in God becomes faith in popes and princes and kings. We must not imitate the world, but Christ in all things, even if we are called to the gallows the grave. When I made this mistake, it cost me only four guilders. If we deceive ourselves now, the price will be eternal. How are they? They wait. The following articles that we have dealt with, in which we have been united as brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ. To baptize those who have repented of their sins and have made an adult and voluntary commitment to follow Christ. To swear no oaths of any kind. To reject the sword as outside the perfection of Christ. And finally, to separate ourselves so that good and evil, believing and unbelieving, darkness and light, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this earth, none will have part with the other. It is not enough that we leave this place in simple agreement. We must go forth fully committed to the course that we have set here. Under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We must go out as sheep amidst wolves. As lambs. To the slaughter.
How say you? Amen. The Brotherly Agreement, or Schleitheim Confession, became the charter of the Anabaptist movement. It did much to give them strength within their ranks. What is that? But it did nothing to lessen the opposition from without. We've been found. Quietly, quickly, out the back. Wilhelm, I can't find Mary. of the monastery that you left, but perhaps better able to give your soul direction. Crude tools should not be necessary among men of refinement. It's one thing to risk your own hand. What about the others? What about them? How can you bear to watch them suffer? How can you bear to cause their suffering? Michael, I'm not a cruel man by nature, but I will do whatever is necessary for the empire and the church. And I'm not a brave man, but I have chosen, along with my brothers and sisters, to suffer whatever is necessary for the sake of truth. Truth? This is heresy! I pray that you turn from your ways when there's still time. I'll run you through. You and your people, one by one, if I have to. Think about it. Quickly, before time runs out. Get back to his cell. Michael, you say marriage is of God. Yes. Were your vows confirmed only between yourself and God? No. Also before a minister. Under whose jurisdiction? The canton of Zurich. By an instrument of the devil? I have not claimed that. You refuse to honor the authority of government? I am bound by scripture to submit to dukes and princes. Ah, so government is ordained of God. Yes. Yet you refuse to take up the sword in defense of your land. In matters of conscience, Christ's followers must choose God's laws above man's. So a man may choose by conscience which laws to obey and which to disregard. The state would crumble if it allowed such freedom. Unless Christ's followers claim such freedom, the church with us. Each day, Ferdinand fights the Antichrist at our throats. Do you deny this? We do not know that the Turks are the Antichrist. We know that they are Turks. Yes. Infidels. So I have heard. Barbarians completely without Christ. I cannot judge that. Is it true, as reported? that you say you would prefer to fight on the side of the Turks against the Christians. Order, let the accused reply. Have I spoken your words? My meaning was... Answer the court! I said that if warring was right, I would rather take the field against so-called Christians if, as you state, Turks know nothing of the Christian faith, then they are but Turks of the flesh. But you, you who would be Christians yet persecute Christ's followers with a sword, you are Turks.
perks of the spirit. You arch heretic! You have seduced pious people! It would be better if you had never been born! God knows what is good. Desperate villain, I tell you, if there were no hangmen here, I would hang you myself and know that I had done God's service. God will judge. Is there no argument that can convince you of the error of your ways? I can only be convinced by scripture. Our charity, the hangman will convince you. In the name of the empire, Michael Sattler, heretic and seducer, shall be committed to the executioner. The executioner is first charged to cut the heretic's tongue from his mouth. Glowing iron tongs shall tear the seducer's flesh seven times between his first ordeal and the fire. And then his body shall be burned to powder as an arch heretic. Gunpowder. Hurry up. Two days after Michael Sattler was burned on the bank of the Neckar River, Margaretha, his wife, was taken here to the same river and drowned. The Anabaptists were sought out, hunted down, and killed. To survive, they had to meet in secret. The persecution of Anabaptists would continue for 200 years in Europe, but somehow their movement continued even as their best leaders were captured and executed. Historians today recognize that Anabaptists were crucial in giving to the modern world such concepts as the separation of church and state, religious toleration, and nonviolence. And today there are over a million Anabaptist descendants in groups such as the Mennonites, the Hutterites, the Amish, the Brethren in Christ. And there are many millions more in the so-called free church movements who trace their spiritual influence through the lines of the Anabaptists. 